Jai. But uh, while we wait for the last people, I'll just make an introduction to today's program and uh, a, a brief run through our, our agenda of today. So uh, a big warm welcome to all of you. Um, this is our third webinar in the se webinar series in the Nordic region, region about the women empowerment principles. Um, the women empowerment principles are a set of principle, principles offering guidance to business on how to promote gender equality and women's empowerment in the workplace, in the marketplace and in the community. And today we will focus on principle five about enterprise development, supply chain, and marketing practices. And we have uh, some very good cases uh, on the program today. Um, first of all, uh, we will have Anna Felt from uh, UN Women to give us a presentation about uh, the principle five. And then we have two companies uh, to give uh, their insights on how uh, Lego has been working with principle five. Uh, and uh, Procter and & Gamble. And when we've had those two presentations, we will uh, have a discussion and questions. So I highly welcome all of you to participate as much as possible. Please stay muted during the presentations because we're gonna be a lot of people on the call, but um, we welcome you to uh, raise your hand or to pose a question in the chat. Uh, and we would love if you raise a, a question in the chat or raise your hand, we would love that you unmute yourself and turn on the, the camera so that we can see each other because it's, it's not very nice to have uh, an interaction with uh, just a, a black screen. So it would be really nice if you would show your face and show who you are. And also if you are on a, a stable um, internet con connection, have your picture on during some of the presentations because then we can see who's, who's, who's joined the seminar. So, um, I can see the number of participants are going up, but the time is also running. So I will, um, I will um, say a big warm welcome to all of you. And then I'll give the word to Anna Felt from, uh, from UN Women to give a presentation about uh, principle five. So big warm welcome to all of you and, and over to you, Anna. Thank you so much. Um, I have a few slides that I wanted to show. So uh, if you could allow me the uh, screen share. Um, and uh, excited, I, I see uh, familiar faces and uh, excited to have this conversation today. This is, uh, I know I see Jamila from uh, Frox and Gamble with a big smile. Uh, we're always talking very passionately about this principle five. Um, so, um, okay, I'm just going to uh, share at the same time. I hope it, it will work. Um, let's see. Can you see my screen? Yeah, yes. And now as well. Yeah. yeah. Yes, great. So, um, the, for those that are new to this webinar series, I just wanted to go over just two slides on uh, generally uh, about the Women's Empowerment Principles. It is a global movement uh, that has been labeled by many of our signatories as a framework, as a journey, as a partnership, as a network. Um, and we have signatories in 141 countries. And since this webinar is uh, specifically uh, today, for the Nordic uh, companies, I just wanted to put up the top 10 countries uh, with the most signatories to also give you a little bit of a challenge to put uh, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, uh, Norway uh, on, on this uh, top 10 list. Uh, we do have most signatories in Brazil, Turkey, Japan, India, China, US, Argentina, Spain, Uruguay, and Chile are really on the rise. So um, uh, I hope that that also offers an opportunity for long uh, supply chain that can actually bring in some of these companies uh, in those countries uh, into yours. Um, today, uh, we are focusing on principle five, as I mentioned earlier, uh, but there are seven principles. And for those that are not yet familiar with them, uh, we do focus on principle one uh, is about a corporate leadership 
and really make sure that uh, the CEO and the executive team is leading this work. Um, it has really shown to really matter uh, that the executive team is, is driving this versus um, one alone person in, in within the company. It requires um, an action plan, a strategy on how to go about it, a team and resources to help move, move the work in, in the company. Uh, principle two, uh, we covered last time in the last webinar, uh, but two, three, and four are focusing on workplace issues from uh, treating all women and men uh, equally at work through pay, through um, advancement, um, career advancement opportunities, through um, support with family responsibilities, and also to be safe. And what has been interesting during uh, the last year is that what we used to talk about under principle two, flexible working arrangement, has actually slid into principle three in the narrative that we hear from companies. That it has become an issue of well being, of health and safety, uh, to have the flexible working arrangements. Um, so that is an interesting take on, on what changes we've seen over the, the past year. Uh, principle five, which I will go into a little bit uh, more in detail, focuses on implementing enterprise development, supply chain and marketing practices that empower women. And as we heard in the introduction, we'll have two great companies that will show uh, a little bit more in detail what they've been doing. Uh, principle six is about engaging women and girls in local communities and to uh, listen to them, to their needs and um, products and services can be targeted specifically towards them to, to help them with their specific needs. And principle seven is also one of my favorites because this is about transparency and accountability. And um, in time for 8th of March, we're actually going to launch a few more indicators uh, that we encourage companies to show where they stand vis-a-vis -vis gender equality. Um, so principle um, five um, will um, have a few different action items. Um, I've highlighted the key words. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but I hope we can share the, the slides afterwards. It's uh, both, it, it's kind of engaging your stakeholders outside the workplace. Uh, so it is about business partners, contractors, suppliers, to make sure that they are part of the work that you're leading on gender equality and women's empowerment. And we do um, encourage all of our signatories to uh, look at both uh, in, in, in its supplier diversity programs, to look at buying both from women entrepreneurs and women-owned businesses, but also from other companies that have taken a strong lead on gender equality so that it takes the, the full um, uh, holistic approach to, towards the supply chain. Um, it also, so while we, on the one hand in this principle, look at those supply chain uh, programs and, and enge engagement with other <coughs> suppliers and, and um, companies that are driving gender equality or are women led, because we know that women uh, need extra support because of the systemic um, discrimination in, in the economy uh, in terms of access to finance and capital and other resources. Um, on the other hand, we also have, um, we are focusing on gender stereotypes in media, company materials, in advertising, and especially for large companies that we have today with us, uh, this matters really. Um, people look up to the commercials that they see whether on TV or on billboards, and they adapt to them uh, and, and do believe that this is the reality. So we are really encouraging companies in their media and um, in the marketing and advertising to show progressive, intelligent people on, on their, um, in, in their uh, images. And this could, for example, instead of always having women doing the laundry, why not putting a man doing the laundry? When it comes to childcare, why do we always see women taking care of the children? So this is an, an, an actually um, an opportunity for companies to show something um, that can lead to societal change and to change stereotypes and norms in, in society. Finally, um, I'd also like to mention the uh, importance of 
making sure that uh, the product services and facilities uh, of your company is not used for human trafficking, labor or sexual exploitation. Um, and this is um, maybe for you and your company straightforward, but also looking into the supply chain to make sure that your suppliers don't engage in, in those activities. Uh, it's also, um, as I mentioned earlier, transparency is really important. And uh, we encourage uh, all of our signatories to publicize the policy statement, both when, when you sign the women's empowerment principles, but also the policies that you have to make sure that people know about it, that stakeholders, your shareholders, everybody knows what you're doing to, on gender equality. And specifically looking at the, uh, doing analysis of the company's supply chain and see who are there, who, who are the, the web signatories that might be your suppliers, who are the women-owned enterprises. And finally, also make sure that you are um, recording complaints and traces regarding the portrayal of your company in, of women and girls in marketing and publishing, uh, public materials to really know where you stand on, on this. And um, last year in December, we published uh, some guidelines on gender responsive procurement. And um, I included the link here, it's quite straightforward, but it does address some of the international standards, the business case, and what web signatories can do to uh, implement gender responsive procurement. We are working now on uh, the gender stereotypes guidance, and that will be forthcoming uh, later in, in the year. Uh, but just to mention before we go into Lego and uh, Procter & Gamble, there are many companies that are in full force working on this principle. Not as many as it is for the workplace principles, but uh, this is very, very important. And that's why we're also focusing this webinar today on, on this topic. Uh, but we have companies in Brazil. What I found interesting in Canada that they, to attract women to their company, they had actually quite progressive um, outreach materials to get women to, to join them uh, since otherwise they felt that there was a certain stigma to trucking and that it's a male dominated sector. So to attract women, they, they uh, really changed their approach on what are the materials that um, showcase them. Uh, many of our signatories have focused on, on COVID and, um, and industry council in the UK. Uh, in the jewelry sector made special efforts to, to really protect um, uh, labor and human rights during this period. So I will leave it at that. This is a quick snapshot uh, into what the principle five is about. And I'm excited to hear the stories from Lego and, and Procter and & Gamble. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you, Anna. Um, just, uh, Really delighted to be here. I'm Cecilia Beckstrom. I head up diversity and inclusion for the LEGO group. And I'm here with my colleague, Charlie Hennicke, who heads up our in-house studio for all LEGO adverts and video content. And I have a very nice and stretched face in this slide as well. <laughs> um, are you able, Charlie, to share your screen and we can dive right in? Um, and I'll kick us off and Charlie will speak further into the work on the stereotypes and how we work to remove them. So yes, maybe I'll start with a little bit of background about the Lego group. So most of you know our little colorful bricks and perhaps the pain that you might have experienced even very recently stepping on one. But we work with a mission ultimately to inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow. We develop play experiences with the intent to nurture learning through play, through an open-ended system essentially that enables endless ideas. And we know that play develops essential 21st century skills such as emotional, cognitive, physical, social and creative skills. And it's particularly the creative skills that are so important because creativity is not only to come up with new and novel ideas and ways to act on the world, but it's critical in helping us all adapt to the world. And the world, as you know, is changing rapidly. And 65% of children who are in kindergarten today will have jobs that haven't been invented yet. So really giving them a head up, heads up or a leg up when it comes to creativity is just critical. 
And if we move to the next slide, Charlie. We are still a family owned company so in Denmark. Uh, but as it happens, we have also become the largest toy company in the world now. And we are also ranked number one most reputable brand in the world on corporate social responsibility. And also recently most loved brand in the world when looking at sentiment analysis on social media. And if you go to the next slide, we also have a close link with the UN organization. So we signed the UN Global Compact in 2003 and we've been part of it ever since. And we've partnered with UNICEF since 2015 and last year. So we are a new signatory, but we did sign the UN uh, Women's, Women's Empowerment Principles, and we are currently crafting a deeper partnership with UN Women to work together on promoting gender equality and removing stereotypes from toys and play materials. And um, if we go to one step further, we have a strong focus on diversity and inclusion, not just the gender perspective, but how we work with representation, essentially, in the broadest sense. So we look at it in terms of the visible and invisible dimensions of human uniqueness. And for us, diversity is a fact, but inclusion is a choice. And for us, progress on this agenda really starts with inclusion, which we see as a leadership behavior and the responsibility of everyone in the company. And inclusion in turn then enables progress on representation. And we do it because a more inclusive company is better placed to attract, retain, develop, and engage employees. And being such a company then means we can mirror the world in how we operate and be more relevant with our consumers, customers, and partners. And all of it leads to a stronger and healthier company and for the ability for us to live up to our mission to inspire and develop all children. Going one step further, Charlie, yes, so we work with DNI uh, both internally in terms of our people and culture agenda, which is my remit, and we also connect DNI to our work externally with kids, parents, and fans. And my last one here slide is that when we look at DNI in our external facing work, we take a holistic view. So for us, we want to engage all children on their passion points and play patterns, not based on gender or other stereotypes. So to do that means we really integrate DNI and in, into our product portfolio, how we research needs and wants, and how we market and communicate, build our brand, and engage our consumers. So with that in mind, I think it's just really cool that having given you this sort of maybe top line introduction, it's it's fantastic that we can hear from Charlie, who is actually involved in the day-to-day -day practicalities of what does it actually take to deliver such experiences. And he's going to share his journey about how to embed some of the practices that we now work with regularly to make sure that who we work with and how we create our content is really much more inclusive and representative of all. So over to you, Charlie. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cecilia. Um, I think I'll kick off by showing a video that we both feed the video teams that you always get to start with video, uh, which does a much better job, I think, of summarising that we have a really, really strong and established heritage. Um, but where we need to face into the future is, is really exciting. And we're certainly not doing it alone. And that's what a lot of this presentation is about, because I'm going to talk to you about something that we have uh, internally as a formal process with our supply chain partners in production called the inclusivity rider and the observant among you will will notice that comes directly more or less from Francis McDormand's Oscar appearance uh, just a few years ago now but now seems to be something that is embedded in a lot of Hollywood and entertainment and production companies so it's something we also have in Lego now and have been running with for a couple of years so before I talk about the rider, I just want to summarise quickly what the LEGO agency does. It is one of the largest in-house communications agencies in Europe, at least, but probably one of the few in the world that specialises in communications to children. And we do that globally, which, as you can imagine, brings in all kinds of uh, challenges around advertising guidelines, child protection and safeguarding. Um, but also we feel we have a really key role to play in reflecting that global audience of children and what they can grow up to be. 
So the Lego agency is first and foremost the idea shop. When we have a new product or a new franchise or a brand launch, it's Lego agency that will develop the communication concepts and ideas internally, working with stakeholders, freelancers, but by and large, lots of in-house creative minds. And we do actually have people sitting in the small town of Billund from all over the world. So that creative workforce is, is very diverse in itself. We're also responsible for packaging. So when you consider the product packaging plus the communication, that is a lot of opportunities to communicate to our audiences globally. And then we work for the specialist area that, that I operate in, we work with partners. Although we have a strong in-house team, when it comes to video production, we might have upwards of 10 different productions on the go at different stages of development. And all of them require something slightly different, specialisms that we just wouldn't invest in in-house, which is quite common for in-house agencies. So visual effects, stop motion animation studios, photography, lighting specialists. We, we go outside and we, we forge partnerships, mostly in Europe, with production companies and animation studios um, to, to execute the work. And one of the things that, that is really interesting is that when you work in a production team, or the final link in the chain, all the strategy has been done, all the brief writing has happened, all the creative thought has happened, and you are at the very final point. So arguably it could be difficult to influence the outcome of the work, um, which is why we identified this area as being critical and one where actually we can have a great deal of influence because we're the ones representing the Lego group when we enter into a partnership with the people who then directly employ directors, writers, uh, crews, and of course, do the casting of the kids who appear in the commercials. So that's the, the spot where we could make a difference and we felt that we should, we should explore. A really quick timeline is that in 2017, the agency actually went on its own kind of mini lockdown way before a, a pandemic was a thing, um, where all work stopped. And for two to three months, our VP at the time said, you know, I want you to go off and look at what it is we're doing and how we can elevate it and where are we maybe letting ourselves down. And what we had done was actually develop a formula for in-house productions, which was very successful and reaching audiences. But we approached a lot of productions in the same way. And a part of that was we worked with the same two production companies year in, year out for every single commercial, um, which had been going on in some cases for over 10 years. I'm really pleased to say that um, today in 2021, we are still working with those partners, but just in very, very different ways. So this wasn't a case of just ditching the people who had supported us for so long and finding new talent. It was actually finding new ways to work with them as well as bringing in new partners. There was a restructure where two in-house agencies merged to become one, which was quite a turbulent time. But that was when I joined uh, the agency and the investment in production and how we actually produce content uh, really started to come up. And then those new partnerships that I mentioned earlier came in in around fall 2018. And that brought a lot of energy and a different perspective and a slightly more cosmopolitan feel to things because we have partners in London, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, as well as maybe closer to base in Jutland. And then around spring 2019, the exec creative director and I were having, uh, we both drive into work uh, or at the time drove into work from the other side of Jutland. So we used to use that drive to call each other in the mornings go through the list of problems to solve, uh, try and come up with some great new ideas for ways of working or, or campaigns. And both of us had started to think about the fact that while there was this desire internally to be more inclusive and to be more representative, it was really hard to get to galvanize teams into taking action. Because if you have 10 different productions going on at the same time, it's very hard to find one team and say to them, you've got to be the ones to put your hands up or stick your neck out and do things substantially differently and lead the way. 
people wanted to keep that slightly conservative way of working because they didn't feel supported or enabled. And so that's where the idea of the rider came in. And the great thing about working with within Lego, which is a very big company, is that if the idea is good and makes sense, you can galvanize people very quickly and you can get support really, really quickly. And Cecilia, I call you out as being one of those people who I think within 48 hours just said, this is a great idea. Speak to this person in procurement, this person in legal, speak to this VP in this area. And it, it actually came to life very, very quickly. Um, implementing it was of course, uh, a slightly slower journey and is still ongoing but actually writing it and defining it and signing off on it was um, was great. I'm just going to slightly rearrange my screen in case I've missed, yeah, I have missed the last one. So <laughs> taking us to, to today, we've actually just launched an updated version of the rider, which has, um, has a little bit more bite to it and is less of a we recommend and is more of a we require this type of behavior. So the, the needle has moved slightly over the past year or two. This is the rider itself. I don't expect you to read through every single <laughs> line and sub clause. Maybe you can see some of the headers. I'm really sharing this to show that it's less than three pages. It does not need to be a lengthy, intimidating, overbearing contract that is only as good as the people who've read it which is so often the way with contracts uh, we've deliberately gone for a simplified approach with terms that are relatable and understandable but also not too restrictive and limiting because what we want to do with this rider when we share it with our suppliers and partners is to stimulate a conversation and that's exactly what it's doing for us so far everybody who receives this has an opinion on it and those range on a spectrum um, and everybody wants to have a discussion about it um, especially as we now include this as one of our formal KPIs when assessing the partnership. So it doesn't take too much. Um, the highlights from this process, the things we, that have come out from implementing this rider, um, sorry from, from the content of this rider because as I said, I don't expect you to read it all here, is that quite simply acknowledges the problem. You know, it says we as a company see that opportunities, um, work exists, but the opportunities for those work are harder to access for some people and we want to do something about it. So that's the first thing is that it's a positioning piece. Secondly, it's very specified to production. So we actually tightly define those roles within production on and off camera, because too often the conversation is about one or the other. But of course, they're so closely interrelated and you could come up with a really representative and inclusive cast. But if you don't have authentic authorship behind the camera, then it's not a successful communication, basically. Um, and it makes the simple commercial link between casting and our audiences. We want to show um, our our consumers and our audiences on screen. And that happens to be pretty much the whole world and all kids. So the sky's the limit when it comes to being inclusive. Um, and we mandate casting with an emphasis on performance skills first. So actually somebody's background or what they look like or even their gender takes a back seat to can they carry the, the performance or acting requirements of the role. And recruitment off screen is done with a view to growing opportunities and I'll come on to that a little bit later on because what we always hear is that the search for talent is difficult and I would like to challenge that. So where we are now is that we've, we have it as a formal KPI. We've also learned what some of our partners have in terms of their own DNI plans and approaches. Sometimes those are incredible and they're way better than anything we could come up with in our own production sphere and they teach us all kinds of things and sometimes they're part of a networked agency or company structure um, so we have learned a lot simply by seeing what some of our partners have running as their own initiatives and codes and policies. We've set ourselves a 20% target 
for female directors, that is 20% of everything we make should be directed by a woman in 2021. And we have inspired other business teams. So there are other areas of the Lego group who have adopted this rider and reworded it and refashioned it and distributed it among their specialist suppliers as well. <clears throat> and the breakthroughs we've had is that searching for great female talent is actually quite easy once you know where to look because a lot of our production companies said oh you know it's really hard there aren't very many female directors or you know that they're, they're all so busy because everybody wants to send them the work and um, I found I think it was Cindy Gallup's um, keynote speech at one of the three percent movements where she stood up and said everybody keeps telling me it's really hard to recruit um, top tier female talent why aren't those recruiters at this conference? Why have they not gone to this market? Because in three days, they would collect some of the strongest CVs in the country and bring that value straight back to their business. And it's just one, one business trip <laughs> and it's free research. Um, sites like Free the Bid and Free the Work have been enormously useful because it's really helpful to just point people to those resources and say there are actual whole international web platforms that do this for you and connect the work to the talent you're looking for. And also um, one of the smaller production companies in Copenhagen who responded to this with us saying, yeah, there aren't very many female commercial directors, but what we've noticed is that a lot of your ideas are documentary based. And we've looked at that sector in Denmark and there's an unusually high rate of female directors. So we're, we're going there and we're nurturing talent relationships there. And it's just thinking a little bit outside the box. Um, Charlie, because... you have to be aware of the time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I have three more points, so I'll do those in 30 seconds. Um, there's a general perception sometimes that female directors are more junior, less experienced, and they cost less. Absolutely not true. Um, and also that the standard process of pitching for three directors we often see there's one female and two male, but actually if we just look at that process and put forward majority female directors, the chances are we're going to appoint a female, but the chances are simply greater. And like I say, that talent is definitely there. And then actually some of the female owned businesses we worked with pointed out that it's not just the director, there's a whole team of people who are influencing what happens on screen um, could we work with them to develop emerging talent to put um, assistant directors onto a shoot to observe and to learn and to get to know us as a client and that is definitely something we can support. All right apologies if I ran slightly over but that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much Charlie and Cecilia for giving us uh, the insights of how you've been working with gender in, in Lego. This was really inspiring. I will quickly give the word to Jamila Belabidi Chahib from um, Procter and Gamble to, uh, to uh, give your insights from Procter and Gamble. And please write all your questions in the chat and think of good questions for the discussion afterwards. So over to you, Jamila. Hello, thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes, very well. Okay. Fantastic. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the invite uh, and thanks to uh, the LEGO team for the fantastic presentation. Very inspiring. Um, so, um, yeah, well, I I'm absolutely thrilled to be with you today to share, uh, to shed light on some of our programs related to supply chain practices and to how we're as well helping women entrepreneurs grow and establish. So, um, my name is Jamila Bilabidi. I am based in Geneva. Uh, I am part of the uh, purchasing function, but actually right now I am in a function agnostic role where I am like really designing and implementing a women economic empowerment program for PNG. And I have been with PNG for 18 years, so quite a lot of time. Um, so uh, 
maybe a few words just to uh, to introduce PNG for those who don't know. Uh, so Procter and Gamble is one of the largest FMCG companies in the world and one of the largest advertiser in the world as well. So what uh, the Lego team has shared earlier really resonates with with, with us in PNG. So um, we do have a pretty much focused portfolio of brands, something like 65 brands, very highly well-known brands like Pampers, Always, Tide Ariel, Ferry, Head and Shoulders, Pantene, and so on. Uh, but what I also want you to know is that we are a very diverse company. We have more than 145 nationalities represented in our workforce, and we operate globally where we sell our products in more than 180 countries and territories. Next slide, please. But today, we are obviously here to talk about women entrepreneurship and to talk about how their economic empowerment is a real fuel for social change and for economic growth for all. So um, let me tell you how it all started uh, at PNG. So there were like probably few numbers, few figures that really shocked us and that got us to really get our hands around this and get started with something, okay? And that one number, specifically one number, was the fact that only 1% of the total spend from both the private sector and the public sector is allocated to women-owned companies, women-led companies, okay? Well, actually, those women-owned companies represent a third of the total SMEs uh, group, and women are, uh, relatively speaking, growing faster as a group of women entrepreneurs. So, after digging into this, we clearly understood that um, also, the reason why they remain small or at best case go to medium side or at exceptional cases go to large size corporation, most of the time those reasons are unfair or just simply bad reasons. Okay, because most of the time those women entrepreneurs are facing many challenges just simply due to their gender profile. Okay, so that is on one end. So really unfair and bad reasons. On the other hand, we also understand and you're not here to be convinced because I guess that all of you who are with us today do understand the business case. But yeah, we also hear and understand that there is a very strong economic imperative in helping those women, those entrepreneurs establish and grow. Okay. And for us as large corporation, there is a compelling business proposal if we were to do so. So it is a no brainer for all to help, you know, with uh, those women entrepreneurs and what we also came to the realization is that procurement or say sourcing whichever you, you you name it right is an important lever to advance that uh, effort and to advance women economic empowerment as a whole so we do need to crack it it's not easy but this is the right and the smart thing to do okay either from the private sector perspective or from public sector perspective, okay? So, um, well, <laughs> the good news is uh, when we really started to think about that, we figured out, well, it's not really, really new for PNG because in the US, we do have a very strong supply diversity program that has been established since the 70s. It really grew to become one of the benchmark program there in that country with more than $2.2 billion per year with diverse companies, out of which half with women-owned companies, okay? So back in 2016, all, all stars seems to line up and we decided based on the knowledge of our supply diversity program in the US, based on the imperative to help, you know, women entrepreneurs, we decided to ex simply expand our supply diversity program to make it a global one, right? But focusing on women entrepreneurs, okay? And uh, for the same reason that SDG 5 is central to the success of all SDGs, we thought that focusing on 50% of the population and on women will help us close faster all other societal or environmental issues. Okay, so I would tell you starting a supply diversity program outside the US is not an easy move. However, we, will, we, will, we heard from Anna earlier about the other webs and what they recommend. I tell you, having the right sponsorship, having the right mindset, and having a pinch of a passion is really all what you need, you need to get started and, and to get successful in setting up such a program. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so here we go. It was very clear for us that this was a strategy of strategic importance to support women entrepreneurs and making this a priority, okay? So after discussions with the external world, with some experts like uh, Anna Falt's team, uh, UN Women in general and other institutions, uh, and, and strong with some of our learnings as we were you know, investigating, we've put together a vision right for this huge opportunity okay and our vision is basically leveraging all our assets in the company we have a massive value chain where we interact and we are interdependent uh, with many 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 women entrepreneurs so our responsibility our vision is to make sure that they can thrive within our ecosystem okay and as a mission what we agreed would be that we need to leverage the learnings we need to build upon our very successful and legacy supply diversity program and make this a global one make this a holistic and integrated program to png okay so um so but because it it can go in all directions really <laughs> like where do you start <laughs> there are women entrepreneurs everywhere so we try to shape it in a way where we as png have the right to talk about or to invest or in to intervene like where we have a legitimate fit so for sure as you think about supply chain area we clearly have a legitimate rate right with more than fifty thousand suppliers so it's not even like an opportunity it's a is a responsibility to play there. Um, the creative chain, as I shared with you, we're one of the largest advertisers in the world. So we definitely have a voice to really drive, uh, to intervene in, in the representation and the economic empowerment of all women talents in that space. Um, but we also want to tackle the innovation space. We strongly believe that in our space, the next billion dollar brand will most likely come from a woman-led startup so we also need to make sure that we are creating this favorable environment inclusive environment for women-led startup so that they are feeling you know uh, invited to the png ecosystem to share their ideas and help them grow their ideas and, and bring them to life and finally, you know, our sales chain, like be it through uh, sub-distribution, how we disrupt the sub-distribution programs or how we, you know, leverage this whole growth around e-commerce and influencers and so on. How are we as well tackling all those women entrepreneurs in that field? So this is how we've sort of framed it to make sure that we can then intervene uh, properly and we can, of course, uh, get all our uh, resources uh, flying accordingly against those. Next slide, please. Okay, so now, <laughs> how are we going to deliver against this mission? Okay, we know where we want to play, but then how are we going to tackle that? So, actually, I will tell you, this strategy has been on for more than four years. And it has been true every time we wanted to, we were updating it. So first, it's really about education and training. And that first pillar is really more internally focused. And I will come back to that. Let me just top level explain how, what are the key, uh, the key pillars and we will go one by one. So first, really about education training. Do not even underestimate that first step. It is foundational. The second is around building the infrastructure. We will be talking shortly and you will see that, uh, unfortunately, um, it is really not, um, I'm just thinking like, okay, you, I, I have not shared with you the right version, but anyway, <laughs> that's okay, we'll continue. So um, the second pillar is really about building the, the infrastructure because what you will see is that we are lacking so much uh, infrastructure outside of the US specifically when we want to focus on diversity of, uh, of suppliers, right? And we will cover that in more depth. And finally, um, you know, we want to make sure we engage all our business partners, okay? Be it suppliers, be it women entrepreneurs, all of the ecosystem needs to be fully engaged. So it's engaging the internal world, it's building the systems, the foundation for people to interact, and it's engaging the external world, okay? So now let's just deep, deep dive in the first one, like um, training and education. I would tell you, this is a key, key one. I know we are, we are I don't have much time, but training and inspiring, most importantly, your buyers is 
critical, okay? You need to get them on with you, but you cannot just force it. Second, you need to make it easy for them to track report progress. So for example, what we've been very busy doing is automating internally tools and system for them to get visibility of their spend with diverse suppliers and with women-owned companies in a click of a button. They cannot work with Excel files knowing the number of suppliers we have. So think about how you make it appealing, inspiring, and easy for your sourcing organization to move on, okay? Next, it's also about, you know, con continuously training your organization about the importance of that. And then nothing, and a powerful way is to just integrate uh, supply diversity or impact sourcing to integrate that as part of a functional training. So when you train them about how to negotiate, when you train them about how to manage suppliers, also train them about how to find, uh, you know, diverse suppliers and how to manage them and how to bring on them on, okay? So anyway, training, super critical. Second time, uh, second thing, infrastructure. This is one, this one is very close to my heart because I made this discovery like five years ago, like, oh my God, it's just not as easy as unplugging the supply diversity program in the US and just plugging it in Europe or Asia or LA. Actually, um, it's, it's a very complicated one because awareness. Like when you come to Europe or Asia and you talk about supply diversity, people just look at you as like, what are you talking about? There is a big awareness gap as to why we need to involve more underrepresented group in supply chains. So there is a need to drive this, to, to drive this awareness and to explain more. And one way to do that, we've partnered with the Women's Forum as a, 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 you know, as a, as a vehicle. We're leveraging their global platform to, to push out the message. We've also co-developed what we call the Daring Circle for women uh, entrepreneurs or for women in business, where we are developing with uh, like-minded organization companies. So you have the uh, consulting firm Kearney, you have knowledge partners like UN Women, We Connect, uh, Cliff for Chance. All this ecosystem is helping you know, bring together what are those gaps and how we can close those gaps. So I really invite you to also look at what is this group doing. Um, so it's through the Women's Forum. We're also trying to influence policies because what you will know in Europe is um, those anti-discrimination laws in place are here firsthand to protect those underrepresented groups. But at the same time, they are somehow counterproductive because they are preventing large corporations to easily access to profiles of, of diverse groups, right? And it's very, very sensitive where you can ask or where you can't ask the profile of companies and how you manage the data and so on. So we're also trying through uh, G7 recommendations, for example, trying to influence those policies and make them, let's say, more. Um, uh, more favorable for the work that we're trying to achieve, okay? And um, finally, uh, as we think of the definition itself, uh, you know, in the US, the, the diverse uh, group uh, definition is around ownership, 51% women controlled. And I really love what Anna said when we started this uh, webinar, where um, it's really like we need to think about it holistically. And for four years, we've been trying to push out a different definition out there. We're really looking in PNG at, uh, at really keeping the end in mind. If the end in mind is to economically empower women, then not all women entrepreneurs are 51% on managed control. And the way we frame it is we want to support women owned, 51% women managed control. We want to support women led, like all those companies that have, uh, that are trusting women to take the decisions, either be it as, as a CEO or as a equal board representation. Those are other, as well companies we want to support. And finally, we know that our largest supplier will probably never be women owned or women led. However, we want to make sure that they are driving the right equality and inclusion policies internally, be it uh, paternity leave, like all the family care policies, be it equal representation, be equal advancement, equal pay, you name it. We want to make sure that there is a very strong level of, um, that we understand there is an expectation from PNG for our partners to be more inclusive and, and tackling any gap that they identify, same as we do anyway, okay? So, um, 
I know we're almost done, but what I want to share as well is uh, the, how we support women entrepreneurs, how we help them establish and grow. Um, so we are as well having a, a massive partnership with WeConnect, where uh, you know WeConnect is this NGO that help us identify women-owned companies around the world, but we have also helped them. Uh, we also they also help us train. So we have this call it PNG Academy, where we train women entrepreneurs around the world, and we have so far hundreds of women entrepreneurs supported, and we will continue to nurture this program. We're helping, as I said, women-led startups through our PG Venture organization, where we help mentor them and so on. But I know we want at least to have a conversation. I can stay hours on this topic. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to cover all what I had in mind, but hopefully, a later date and uh, hopefully you can leave some time for questions. Thank you so much, Jamila, uh, for this great presentation from Procter & Gamble. Uh, now is the time for the discussion and time is running. I have noted down uh, at least uh, two questions uh, in the chat. Uh, one from Shireen Nasrip. Um, that is asking, how uh, do you develop women talent in developing countries? And I guess it's both for you, Jamila, and also for, for, um, for uh, Cecilia and Charlie in Lego. Um, and maybe due to the time, I'll just pose one other question, which is um, how to increase engagement of BIPOC, and that is... Um, black indigenous uh, people of color. Um, so if I start with these two questions, uh, I guess we can have one more question if one wants to raise their hand or put one in the, in the chat, then we'll quickly go to that. But I don't know who will answer the questions sure. first, if it's sure. you, Jamila. Shall we, divide, or... shall we divide and conquer? Jamila, take the question about talent in developing countries, because I would say PNG is probably further yeah. on that journey than we are, and Charlie yeah. can offer up a view on the BIPOC engagement that, piece that's based a good... on our experience. Let's do that. So I'll give okay. it to you, Jamila. Yes, sure. Well, there are many responses to your question. Uh, first of all, I think we need to go to uh, probably the roots, right? And make sure that first we're as well um, focusing on, on girls, right? And uh, as part of our gender equality uh, strategy, there is a very strong focus on keeping girls in school, first of all. Okay, making sure that we're not losing them as they grow and especially through their period uh, period. So um, there is a huge focus from PNG on making sure that this is true. And uh, we're also partnering with a lot of university to, to help, to enable, to advertise. Uh, we are supporting universities, especially to drive uh, women to be more interested in STEM uh, type of, uh, you know, curriculums. That's the other thing. And of course, once they are recruited, once they are in-house, there are many programs to help them be themselves and help them grow like be it mentorship be it affinity groups you know like uh, uh, women uh, uh, networks right that are helping uh, make them comfortable and and guide them uh, to develop their their career within the company so a very quick answer because i know we don't have time but there are many many ways to do that and we can talk offline anytime thank you so i'll pick up the the question about the BIPOC group, that, that is something we hear quite a lot independently. Uh, also, when it comes to recruitment, <clears throat> for example, we know that really strong production talent uh, it, within this group is not always found on the channels that we recruit on. So that's, that's a challenge in terms of actually making the content. But when it comes to the commercials itself, we've recently set up an internal DNI advisory board composed of people from these backgrounds and others who between them receive all of the work that we produce at draft stage and they give us input, feedback, comments based on their own lived experience and, and needing to be reached. And for example, if they have children, understanding how their children will be communicated to. And we have actually so far already this year made at least one quite substantial intervention. We were doing something we thought was, was fine or was good but actually there were challenges to it and it could have been a lot more effective. And this board actually intervened and we revisited the production. So we're seeing that it's actually driving 
change already, even though it was only established right at the start of this year. And we'll extend that to external bodies as well, because there's always that thing that people who work for the brand are sometimes seeing things slightly differently to people who sit outside. Thank you, Charlie. I'm conscious we are out of time and we might have just lost Sarah due to some technical hitch. So I, I feel slightly I, uncomfortable. I'm, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> oh, there you are. Sorry. <laughs> okay, there is one more question and I don't know if I can pose it to you, Anna. It's about certification schemes uh, and how we, we work with that. Would you give a brief uh, answer to that if you're still here, Anna? Yes, I'm here. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Do you want me to so, read the question or have you got it? Yes, I saw the question. It was in relation to EDGE and other certification yes. schemes. So I, I think it, it met, this question might have been triggered when I talked about the indicators that we are launching uh, next week uh, for the 8th of March to ask companies to be more transparent about what they do on different outcome indicators. Um, and, and how that leads to, to gender equality. Um, that said, we have been working on these indicators for some time. Uh, we have conducted a community of practice around corporate reporting, and uh, Edge and Bloomberg, uh, Equilip, and many others that have indices and, and um, uh, certification schemes have been collaborating with us to, uh, to come to this point. Uh, and we are seeking solutions for, because there are lots of certifications and I think it was a year and a half ago when we heard new certification schemes every month, uh, maybe because we were also in that space, but there's a lot of effort to hold companies to account. And the reason is also because there is this increased um, demand from consumer to see what companies are buying from in terms of the the brands and the products they are buying, who are they buying from? The challenge are more um, critical to, to kind of know where they are working. I think the generations have changed and, and the new generations are really looking to uh, align their values with the company they work for. Investors are getting really um, in, excited about this and see gender equality uh, companies, companies that take gender equality seriously as, as a safer uh, investment. So. Um, there, there's a lot of pressure, I think, on companies, and with this has also come this um, demand for certification. Um, at this point, from our side, from the Women's Empowerment Principles, we rely on the companies that the data they provide us is accurate. Um, I think in the future we will um, add some more um, auditing function to that. Uh, but at this point, we know that if company puts something out that is incorrect, uh, they they will uh, hear from from their stakeholders. So we we think that what what they give us um, is is uh, right. But I, I do um, encourage all of of the existing um, certification and indices to continue this work because only with that we'll get to more transparency and and accountability to gender equality and women's health. Thank you so much, Anna. I will quickly move to a close and say thank you to Cecilia and Charlie and Jamila for your presentations from LIGO and Procter and & Gamble. Also say thank you to Anna and UN Women for this uh, partnership in the series of our Women Empowerment Principles. We have uh, one other seminar to come. Uh, it's on the 7th of April uh, at uh, 3 o'clock uh, Central European time. So please stay tuned and I hope that many of you will join us again to hear about the principle seven. Um, I would also, because now uh, Anna, you mentioned the, the investors. Uh, we, on the 8th of, of, uh, of March, we are celebrating the International um, Women's um, Day. And uh, we're doing that with NASDAQ in, in, uh, in um, stock exchange all over the world. And we're doing it in Copenhagen as well. Uh, so please uh, register and join. It's going to be online due to COVID, but we will put focus on the barriers for women to, to get to leadership positions and also in boards of, of companies. 
uh, and we want to, to make a discussion and highlight that we need more women in leadership positions. We need more women entrepreneurs. We need more uh, managing directors that are women and also more women in boards of companies. And especially Denmark is lagging behind in this area. So this is really a, a very important issue. Then I also want to, see, uh, to, to, to showcase another event, which Global Compact is also having. Um, it's called Target Gender Equality Live, and it's on the 16th of March. Uh, and it's also an open seminar. It's a full day. So, so, uh, so look at, um, at, uh, at our website and, and register. That would be great. And Anna, you just uh, corrected me that more than 100 stock exchanges are ringing the bell for gender equality. Uh, so it's really uh, very, very impressive that we have 100 stock exchanges all over the world. Uh, yeah, it's increasing bell. every day. So um, the new figure of today is actually 101. Fantastic. Yeah. So that will be the last from us. Thank you to you and women, uh, and we will hope to see many of you again on the 7th of April. Uh, thank you for joining us, and have a nice day. I hope you will join us as well on the 8th of, 8th of March and the 16th of, of March and, and then in April. So stay tuned and keep the discussions and keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.